not, we are going to get it on. Mike Sempervivi here with you for the next hour, talking professional wrestling, which is something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. However, you're joining me today, tune in, iHeart, American Forces Radio, sportsbyline.com, over-the-air affiliates like the Mightier 1090, replaying on Sirius XM, via podcast or video streaming on Twitch or on YouTube. I'd just like to say thank you for spending a little bit of time with me today. As always, there's a lot to get into. How did you spend your weekend? If you're the regular host of this show, Brian Alvarez... You spent it getting chopped to death by filthy Tom Lawler, getting slapped to death by Killer Kelly, getting pinned in the middle of the ring, and then getting heckled by CM Punk at the post-show scrum of AEW. There was a lot of wrestling this weekend, which really, 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 really did just completely put a nice bow on the end of what was a nice wrestling week. I'm not sure if anybody remembers any wrestling took place over the weekend after that AEW post-show presser, but we're going to go into everything that took place. We have some quotes from the post-show presser, all cleaned up because, well, CM Punk and post-show press conferences aren't, aren't really good and don't really mesh well with the FCC. They also apparently didn't mesh well with the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega, and we're going to get all into that, as well as the actual wrestling that took place in the ring. One thing that has come out because of AEW All Out last night, not only the pay-per-view but the post-show scrum, is nobody is talking about Drew McIntyre not beating Roman Reigns and Roman Reigns being well now into his third year as a WWE Undisputed Champion. Uh, on Saturday afternoon, there were a lot of people wondering about that decision. Now as we go into Raw on Monday night, nobody's talking about it. It was a wild weekend, folks. Get into every little last bit of it when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi here with you. Brian Alvarez will be back tomorrow, possibly doing the show from an ice bath. I'm not quite sure. But, uh, you know, we do this show here for an hour at a time every single day. But if you want to try to get at us 24-7, you know how to do it. You can do it on Twitter. I am at SemperVB. The timeline for this show is at WONF4W. If you'd like to pass on your wishes to Brian on his recovery, you can do that at Brian Alvarez. The broadcaster is at Sports Byline USA. And if you love pro wrestling, at Mid-Atlantic Pod, some of the best stuff of Jim Crockett Promotions history over there. Well, let's just get right to it, right? (laughs) There was AEW All Out, the pay-per-view. And then there was the post-show presser. And uh, at at that presser, CM Punk addressed several topics. Let's just say passionately. And, uh, you know, the thing just started hot (laughs) when he was asked about Colt Cabana. And what I have done is just gotten some clips uh, from the uh, from the post-show presser here that I'm going to play in a moment. Don't worry, I have edited out, uh, I believe, most of the curse words. There were plenty coming out of CM Punk's mouth last night when discussing all of the issues that he wanted to discuss. Immediately, he started talking about Cole Cabana and launched into a defense over his reasoning on ending that friendship with Colt Cabana, he offered details of disagreements, including mentioning financial disputes several times, uh, which had arose from the defamation lawsuit brought against he and Cabana by WWE Dr. Chris Amon after Punk appeared on Cabana's Art of Wrestling podcast in 2014. Uh, Tony Khan was right there, seated beside CM Punk as he went through his addressing of grievances and Punk not only made direct reference uh, to the backstage drama in AEW, he appeared to have accused AEW vice presidents Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks of spreading false rumors about him, although he never mentioned them by name, only by company title. One man he did mention by name 
Hangman Adam Page, whom he criticized for being unwilling to take advice from veteran wrestlers and for making unscripted comments against him on TV in the lead up to Double or Nothing, that Punk said uh, he felt as though jeopardized the company's first million dollar gate. Uh, Punk's comments <laughs> reportedly caused turmoil following the press conference. I'll go ahead and have producer Dom play Punk's comments right now for everybody, and then I'll get to what happened following those comments. But I've eaten on this. All right, you're off, Mike. Long time. Um, and I am, I'm very sad today that I had to get up here and, and, and say his name. He doesn't deserve it uh, and talk about it. But facts are facts, you know. Name two people that have made the most money off the name CM Punk. I don't think you're there yet. The first one's Vince McMahon. The second one's Scott Colton. Now, it's 2022. I haven't been friends with this guy since at least 2014, late 2013. And the fact that I have to sit up here because we have irresponsible people who call themselves EVPs and couldn't can manage a target, and they spread lies and 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 put into a media that I got somebody fired when I have all to do with him, want nothing to do with him, do not care where he works, where he doesn't work, where he eats, where he sleeps. And the fact that I have to get up here and do this in 2022 is embarrassing. I'm taking a head on because you never but said I'm trying anything. to run a business. And when somebody who hasn't done a damn thing in this business jeopardizes the first million dollar house that this company has ever drawn off of my back and goes on national television and does that. It's a disgrace to this industry. It's a disgrace to this company. Now we're far beyond apologies, right? I gave him a chance. It did not get handled. And you saw what I had to do, which is very regrettable, lowering myself to his level, but that's where we're at right now. And I will still walk up and down this hallway and say, if you five seconds, problem with me take it up with me let's go well it seems as if three people that had a problem with this was kenny omega and the young bucks fightful select reported early this morning that omega and the bucks were extremely angry with one source claiming that they were threatening to walk over the comments what that means exactly we are unsure of if you're a subscriber to this website, WrestlingObserver.com, you would know this morning on Wrestling Observer Radio that Brian noted his sources told him an altercation took place between Punk and the Young Bucks and that a security guard went rushing out of the scrum to attend to the confrontation. During the same show, Dave described the scene as, quote, a melee. So that's where that stands as of right now. CM Punk, although I did not cut this audio, did point to Brian and was upset over Brian being very incredulous during the Brian and Vinny show when speaking about Punk going off script and ripping into Hangman Page. Although online you would think that Punk verbally eviscerated Brian and came after him. That was not the case. Brian did respond to Punk, saying that he did give his side of the story as well. And while Punk was eating a variety of muffins and other pastries he had gotten from a local bakery there, and he put them over, and I can't remember what it was, but the way he was going at him, it looks like I may want some of those pastries as well. But uh, uh, that's all it was with he and Brian. It's uh, Although online, again, you would think it was much, much bigger. The true issues Punk has, obviously, with the Young Bucks, Kenny Omega. And that's something that Tony Khan has got to figure out here very, very soon. We're not done with Tony Khan in that press conference because when asked about projected pay-per-view numbers for All Out by WrestleNomics' Brandon Thurston, Khan expressed some disappointment appointment saying he expected them to be slightly down from last year's all-out event and here's his comments from there it's probably a little bit more challenging in the marketplace um when it becomes a little more crowded so our performance given you know the prior years we never had this kind of competition and it's kind of a first 
for us in AEW to see this kind of crowded marketplace. I'm not sure if this is what we'll see from now on. If it is, when the fight is brought, I will continue uh, bringing up fights of my own, and I have unique ways to do that and a lot of money to fight with. And uh, this is not a game to me. This is uh, my life, and I don't think it's a joke, uh, and I take it really seriously. You'll notice that both CM Punk and Tony Khan sounded like they were put through the Barry White Love Unlimited Orchestra filter. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what went on with the sound for the post-show scrum, but that is what we were able to lift from it. We did not add in those effects. But, uh, you know, Khan was on Wrestling Observer Radio this weekend with Garrett Gonzalez and Dave and talked a lot about this, talked about WWE now invading Labor Day weekend. But there was also a lot of talk going into this weekend about would the numbers be down? Did they do damage to themselves in the lead up? Did they give them enough themselves enough time for the lead up, even if all of this other backstage drama wasn't taking place? And there were people that were wondering about, OK, will it be down? Now, we don't know how much it's down. It sounds like he's disappointed how disappointed he is we're not sure he did kind of go on a tirade against wwe uh profanity laced tirade uh, uh you know dropped a couple of f-bombs here and there and expressed his displeasure about being counter-programmed by wwe but i think the reality of the situation here is if this number is down the only person that tony khan can kind of point to is, is himself because clash at the castle was on saturday Saturday. And sure, WWE's gotten a lot of attention, and they've been kind of hot recently. That's absolutely true. And yes, they did decide to put NXT on Sunday just to kind of stick it a little bit to AEW. But the fact of the matter was that show was on at 4 p.m. Eastern time in Orlando on Peacock. So I don't know as much as the attention as WWE may have wanted to take away from AEW. I don't know if that's the reason the show would have been slightly down. We'll actually get to what happened in the ring when we get back from break. Wrestling Observer Live. Back on the show, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper, VB here with you. The big boss man, Brian Alvarez, will be back tomorrow. I don't think he'll be doing a show with Filthy Tom Lawler today. No post-mortem. It almost was a post-mortem for Brian Alvarez. He dared put hands on Killer Kelly. He chopped Killer Kelly in the chest. She didn't sell it. What she did do was grab Brian around the neck and then slap the hell out of him. A little bit later on, filthy Tom Lawler did his best impression of Walter combined with Satoshi Kojima and Kenta Kobashi both just chopping Brian to death. As Kevin Gill said on the broadcast, his little chicken chest <laughs> getting blown up. Ultimately, Killer Kelly... And Filthy Tom Lawler defeated Brian Alvarez and Billy Starks on Thursday evening. Black Label Pro and the Game Changer Wrestling Show. Lots of Game Changer Wrestling uh, stuff from over this weekend as well, too. John Moxley made some surprise appearances at Hoffman Estates. Went out there, went face-to-face -face with Nick Gage. Nick Gage's career is on the line against John Moxley's GCW title. That will be coming up in October. We also had a, a wild uh, war game style in the GCW style war games uh, Two cage ladder or a two cage match, two rings that ended up seeing uh, the the Briscoe brothers try to go after the GCW championships again. Ultimately, at the end of the day, those titles uh, were won by it wasn't Matthew Justice and. Uh, who was it now? I can now. I just, oh, it was uh, Alex Cologne. It was, how, how could I forget about this? It was Alex Cologne and John Wayne Murdoch, and Cologne caught such a bad one in the match, he had to be transported to the hospital via EMS. Don't worry, he's okay. He was tweeting his way through it, uh, just sitting in there in the waiting room covered in glass and blood. He must have been quite a sight. Uh, although in Chicago, you never know. That could have just been a, a regular Thursday night there or Saturday night there. That's when that match took place. But so a bunch that that happened there unfortunately we're, we're probably not going to get into it because there was a whole lot of other stuff from aew and wwe over the weekend that press conference that i talked about in the first segment that was actually attached to the all out for pay-per-view which took place yesterday 16 matches 
It was long. There was a lot of stuff on this show. Tony Khan talked about, man, you know, people have been hurt. We haven't had matches available for Rampage. I've had to do this and that with Dynamite. You didn't need 20 matches or 16 matches on this show. There were a ton of them. The Zero Hour pre-show got an addition of the Trios AAA mixed, or I'm sorry, the mixed uh, AAA tag titles. Sammy Guevara and Ty Mello defeated Ortiz and Ruby Soho. The only thing I will remember about this match is there was a spot where Soho was coming off Sammy Guevara's shoulders and... She just landed right on her neck. Unfortunately, at some point in the match, I'm not sure if it was there or not, I would believe it, broke her nose. Just really, it was a rough go of things. Uh, I have not seen a, sorry, I haven't seen a Sammy and Tay. They're great together. I'm not sure I like any of these mixed tag matches so far with them. Uh, they Not so good. FTW title hook defeated Angelo Parker with Matt Menard to retain the title. He was actually on the defense for a lot of this match. They gave Angelo Parker a little bit, but hook ended up getting the victory. Afterwards, he was laid out by Matt Menard. 2.0 went after him, and that's when Action Bronson, who was shown in the crowd, came out throwing around Angelo Parker and Matt Menard like he used to do to people that would jump on stage. He'd invite them on stage during the shows, and then he'd, like, you know, Death Valley driver them off of there. Call me crazy, since he's from Queens and Hook's from Queens. Arthur Ashe Stadium? Mm. He's got a little bit of actual wrestling training experience, Action Bronson does. And he's the biggest fan in the world up there with a lot of other celebrities that love wrestling. So as far as will this guy take this seriously? Yes. Yes, I believe that he will. All-Atlantic Championship, Pac, excuse me, Pac, still the stuck after all these years of doing that. Pac defeated Kip Sabian to retain the title. Really not a, a whole lot going on with that. This was a great example of a match that... Didn't really need to be on the pay-per-view. Now, we have a pack orange Cassidy situation coming up. Maybe they really wanted to get there quickly. They had to do it on Wednesday to start setting things up. But this was one of those matches that you probably could have waited on and just went ahead and built up towards Dynamite or even Rampage coming up this week. One match, one could say, should have been on the pay-per-view, but I understand why it wasn't because it was a cold match. There was no feud here, and you know what? If I had to sell people on wanting to pay money for my pay-per-view, I think I might put Eddie Kingston and Tomohiro Ishii in the main event spot on the pre-show to rile everybody up. They riled each other up. Suplexes, lariatos for days, and of course, chops aplenty. Ultimately, Eddie Kingston got the victory. They shook hands afterwards. She pushed him away when it came time for Kingston to try to help him back to the locker room. A really impressive performance for Eddie Kingston. Something that after all of this drama that's been going on with him, after being suspended, after having all of these headaches that have taken place with him, many of them self-caused by his own admission, Eddie Kingston gets a match with Tommy or Ishii. Probably a match he wanted a lot more than with Sammy Guevara. And he ends up having a banger, which leads into the pay-per-view. First match, casino ladder match. Wheeler Yuta, Dante Martin, Claudio Phoenix, Penta, Roosh, and Andrade. During the match, a bunch of guys in all black ran out and started attacking everybody. One went up to the top of the ladder to take the chip. He revealed himself to be Stokely Hathaway. Then everyone else pulls their masks off. There's Ethan Page. There's uh, W. Morrissey. There's the Gun Club. There's Lee Moriarty. This leads into the Joker's entrance, and we get the strains of the Rolling Stones' Sympathy for the Devil. I know Scorpions uh, for the final countdown, or sorry, Europe, they ask for a ton of money, so much that no one, even Tony Khan, would have been willing to spend that money for Brian Danielson. The Rolling Stones, I don't know if they're in that category or not, but I've always heard that they are. So however much money was paid for Sympathy for the Devil to be played, you knew it had to be a big deal. And out came a guy in a mask who seemed to have the same gait of MJF. And he walked down, and he 
He took the chip away from Stokely, and he looked like he was going to take his mask off, and then he just flipped off the crowd and he left. But you knew something was obviously going on there, and I think at that point, people had a feeling that MJF was going to be back by the end of the night. It was then time for the finals of the AEW Trios Tag Team Title Tournament. The Elite defeated Hangman Adam Page in the Dark Order. Match went a little under 20 minutes. It's one of those things, if you don't like Hangman, or I'm sorry, if you don't like, oh, hey, throw Hangman into that mix now, but definitely if you don't like the style of Omega and the Young Bucks, you know, you probably have a beef with this match. Whether you like him or not, nobody can do, with the exception of maybe throwing Will Ospreay and Kota Ibushi into that mix, Almost nobody can do what those guys do. Whether you like the style or not, they're excellent at it. The end came when Silver set Omega up for the buckshot. Omega got out of the way. Page smashed Silver, allowing Omega to get the victory. So the Elite are the very first trios champions. Jade Cargill defeated Athena in about four minutes. Might have been the best Jade Cargill's looked. It was kept short. They had a <laughs> devastating spot in the beginning. Athena outside the ring drop kicked Layla Gray into the barrier between uh, the the fans and the ramp, and she looked like she absolutely killed her. She went smashing into that. But Jade Cargill, dressed as She Hulk, got the victory. She looked fantastic, at least as far as the aesthetic goes. Like I said, the work in the ring getting a little bit better. They did a good job laying that match out. Got the victory over Athena. Six-man tag team match. Wardlow and FTR defeated Jay Lethal in the Motor City. Did I just say that? The Motor City Machine Guns. Shout out to the Mitten. Oops. Wardlow hit Lethal with a big headbutt. I didn't even mean to do that. I like Royce to 5'9", okay? I like Doughboy's cash out. I'm sorry. I apologize, Detroit. A big headbutt, a lariat, but he pulled the straps down. Uh, Wardlow did. Power Rom Symphony, that was that. Went about 16 minutes and 30 seconds. Went a little bit longer than I thought it was going to go, but there was a lot of talent in that match. Afterwards, Samoa Joe's music played. He ran out, took out Satnam Singh, and then all of the baby facers uh, cornered Sanjay uh, in the ring. Sanjay came out with a shirt mocking Dax Harwood's daughter and mocking Dax, saying that he was going to fight like an eight-year-old girl and that was a bad idea because Dax's daughter was there and she ran down to the ring snapped his pencil in two Dax then hit him and his daughter put her foot on his chest and this is the referee counted three that was a really really cool moment I like that a lot and you know we're wondering why are Wardlow and FTR in this match there's a lot of things you could be doing with them but at the end of the day, I thought that was a cute moment. I'd like to see Sanjay Dutt start getting a little bit more serious, though. I mean, he's been such a cartoon character out there, and maybe the whole reason was because it was going to lead towards this thing with Dax. But I got to be honest, if he's going to continue to be a manager, whether it be on TV and AEW or only in ROH, I'd like to see him step it up a little bit. Powerhouse Hobbs and Ricky Starks. People are complaining, whining, bitching, moaning about this. The only thing I'm going to complain about is it went five minutes, but the reality of the situation is Ricky Starks lost nothing. Powerhouse Hobbs was put over him at a distinct level. Okay, it doesn't mean that Ricky Starks is dropping down the list. He's right where he needs to be. It was about getting Powerhouse Hobbs up a little bit. Should it have had more time? Absolutely. Could it have been on Dynamite? Maybe. Should it have had more time on this show? Probably. But I can't talk about it anymore on this show because we need to go to break. Be back with the rest of the card, plus Clash at the Castle and Worlds Collide. Wrestling Observer Live. TV back here with your Wrestling Observer Live. I almost forgot for all the ASMR kids out there. You ready? That was for you. Bad news if you're traveling around in your car right now, listening to Sports Byline, hoping to hear some live scores out of Major League Baseball. If you're in Baltimore right now, you got a doubleheader with the Toronto Blue Jays where you could make up some games and finally get yourself into the final three for the American League wild card race. Unfortunately, right now, bottom of the ace, you're losing four to two. Yankees up on Minnesota right now, five to two. Aaron Judge, 54th homer today. So that's the only baseball that is taking place before we get off the air here. I know that's got nothing to do with all of you that are listening for pro wrestling. So I'm going to get right back into the all-out results from last night. Swerve in our glory defeated the acclaimed to hold on to the AEW World Tag Team titles. And look, 
After his match, Kenny Omega, as they were going up the ramp, turned around to the, the camera and told everybody back in the locker room, see if you can beat that. Then FTR and Wardlow and Jay Lethal and the Motor City Machine Guns, they tried. And if you're a, more of a fan of that style, they succeeded. The reality is, though, you could take those two six-man tag team matches, put them up against Swerve and Our Glory and the Acclaimed, and you know what? Swerve and Our Glory and the Acclaimed was the tag team match of the night. The crowd was outstanding for this. They were dying to see the Acclaimed get the victory at the end, to the point where they ended up booing Swerve and Keith Lee out of the building at the end. When Swerve Strickland got the victory, he looked up with this big smile on his face. It was fantastic. I don't think the fans are going to continue to hate on Swerve and Our Glory. It was just one night, but that's because they love the acclaim so much. That's going to keep going for sure. But a, you know, it was an interesting decision to put this match on this show, but frankly, I mean, I'm so happy for those four guys for the crowd reaction that they got. And it was one of those matches too that it probably went on a little bit too long. There were probably a couple of superfluous kickouts, which doesn't make it a classic match unless you were there watching it. And then it was a classic match because everything that they did popped the people in the crowd. I got to be honest, pop me sitting there at home. I thought it was excellent. Swerve in our glory, get the victory, hold on to the titles. Then it was time. And I tell you what, that was... A lot, there were a lot of matches. There was a lot to ask for out of those fans at the Now Arena. They really did a good job, I thought, sticking with the interim AEW Women's Championship four way. Tony Storm defeated Britt Baker, Hikaru Shida, and Jamie Hayter, who was over like Rover, like over like a million bucks. Britt and Jamie and, and Jamie are, had problems at the end. It looked like Jamie was going to get the victory. Britt ends up pulling her out of the ring. That, of course, ticks her off. Ultimately, Tony Storm got the victory. A little bit of drama on the women's side of, th of things still in the locker room. At least one could take it that way because at the post show, Storm commented on being the interim champion by saying, quote, I mean, it's not ideal, but Thunder Rosa says she's injured. Okay, so when she says she's not injured, she can come back and lose to me. And that'll be the end of that. They were just tag team partners on television. You can put Tony Storm in the camp of people um, that I believe would probably also fit maybe Jamie Hayter, who had her nose broken, and Britt Baker, who has taken every opportunity she, she can on national TV to throw shade at Thunder Rosa. I bet you you can probably put them in one camp and, and maybe have Thunder Rosa in the other camp right now. But, uh, yeah, so we'll have to see what kind of comes from that. Christian Cage defeated Jungle Boy Jack Perry. Yep, got to say his whole name now, everybody. Christian came out for the match with his arm in a brace. In the storyline, his arm was injured when Jungle Boy slammed it into the steel steps a couple weeks ago on Dynamite. Thing is, he's actually hurt, and it could be significant, according to this morning's Wrestling Observer Radio. Match only went 33 seconds. Jungle Boy was attacked by Luchasaurus and choke slammed on the stage area. Luchasaurus then power bombed Jungle Boy through a table at ringside, right in front of his mother and sister. Once Jungle Boy was able to get to his feet, the match began. Christian speared him and then gave him the kill switch for the victory. So. That feud will continue, but it will continue by proxy because it will be Luchasaurus who, it should be noted in this entire deal with Jungle Boy and Christian, even though he seemed to turn on Christian, he never did anything diabolical to Christian who said that he loved Luchasaurus. So Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy will be the continuation of this feud, which I'm completely fine with because with the turtleneck, with the with the jacket on, and with that face, Christian looks like a, a TV villain. Like, I'm not saying a movie villain, but he is right off of, like, a TV drama. Like, he is perfect for that role. Chris Jericho, Brian Danielson... I thought this was great. I mean, this was just really great pro wrestling. Chris Jericho pulling it back to the past. The match went damn near 25 minutes. Uh, 
Jericho gets the victory over over Danielson. People will criticize Brian Danielson not getting enough victories or anything like that. I honestly think that stuff's really overblown. You know, if he's giving Daniel Garcia something, he's doing it for a reason. He's elevating him. He loses nothing. He loses to Chris Jericho here. What does he lose? He didn't lose a damn thing in this match. Jericho, low blow, ends up getting the victory. That's that. Afterwards, a little bit later on, Jericho ran into uh, Daniel Garcia in the back. Garcia was watching this match on a monitor. He was still a little upset with Jericho breaking out the chair that he wanted to beat uh, Brian Danielson with last week. Bottom line is this. Daniel Garcia's got a match against Wheeler Yuta for the ROH Pure title that'll be coming up. Jericho appreciates Asian society will not be in his corner. Garcia's got to do it all on his own. Don't be surprised if Garcia actually does it all on his own and then leads to more headbutting with Chris Jericho coming down the line. Darby Allen, Sting, and Miro defeated the House of Black, Malachi Black, Brody King, and Buddy Matthews. Last week when I was talking about Dynamite, I pointed out what Darby Allen pointed out in his interview, which was, hey, Brody King, hey, Buddy Matthews, where was Malachi? When you were choking me out, where was Malachi when you were doing your damage? You don't need that guy. And with all the the talk about Malachi Black, whether he's asked for his release or not, whether he is happy in AEW or not, whether he needs to take some time off for himself in his own mental state, whatever the situation is, after the match, Malachi Black looked around, he saluted the crowd, and he went back up the ramp. This is following him having missed blown in his own eyes by Sting and taking the fall to Darby Allen. So what does this mean? I guess we'll have to see. CM Punk defeated John Moxley in the main event of the show. A lot of heat match went nearly 20 minutes. A really, really, really good match. I, I, I thought it was at least. Afterwards, the lights went out. A phone recording of Tony Khan was then played, talking to someone. Tony is talking about eating his pride for the sake of the fans. He tells this mystery person they'd be in the casino ladder match, that they didn't have to sign an extension, and they'd be paid a bleeped out sum of money. A video from ROH then played of CM Punk talking about the devil's greatest trick, being that he made people believe that he didn't exist. And that brought out Maxwell Jacob Friedman who said he is the devil. He made the universal belt motion, said it's going to be coming home with him, and then flipped the crowd off. Huge response for MJF. He is back. There's concern about MJF being a babyface. I think once he gets on the microphone, that won't be an issue. But I also look at a team that's got the Gun Club and Lee Moriarty and a, a bunch of guys from the greater New York City area like Stokely Hathaway and, and W. Morrissey, and I ask myself, hmm, <laughs> hmm, when they go to Arthur Ashe, what is the response going to be? Probably going to be pretty big. When they're in Newark for the next uh, pay-per-view coming up in November for those two days, probably going to get a hell of a response here they made a create he may have created a monster with mjf but then again mjf is incredible on the microphone and if anybody can turn the fans around on them he probably could do it there was a world's collide show yesterday as well too this is the one that tony khan is pretty upset with as far as being added uh to to sunday but the reality of the situation is as i mentioned this came on at four o'clock and while it was a good show I didn't see anything on this that would have really, you know, tired people out too much from watching AEW later on in the night. It was a five-match card. The highlight for me was Ricochet and Carmelo Hayes. And Carmelo Hayes, it, it opened up the show, retained the North American Championship. Uh, the end came when Ricochet hit the recoil. Trick pulled his leg on a pin attempt. A little bit later on, Ricochet went for a shooting star press, landed on his feet when Hayes got out of the way. Then he caught him in a small package got the victory there match won about 60 minutes they had time it was a good match i thought that was the best thing on the show main event braun breaker defeated tyler Bate to unify the nxt and nxt uk championships katana chance and caden carter defeated dewdrop and nikki ash to retain
retain the NXT Women's Tag Team Championship. Mandy Rose, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised, defeated B. Priestley, a.k.a. Blair Davenport, and Mako Satamora to win the NXT UK Women's Championship and roll that into her NXT Women's Championship. I guess Toxic Attraction and Mandy Rose are going to be staying down, and that's Probably the best thing that could happen for Toxic Attraction and the Fatal 4-Way Tag Team Elimination Match to unify the NXT and NXT UK Tag Team titles. Pretty Deadly came out with the victory, and that made me happy because, well, I, I like Pretty Deadly, so that worked for me. Clash at the Castle, Principality Stadium in Wales. Like I mentioned on Saturday, there was a lot of talk after the main event over whether they made the right move or not having Roman Reigns hold on to the championship. And... To be honest with you, yeah, it, it's fine. You know, I would have put the belt on Drew. I think you could have done that and then had Roman win it back. He got a long time to go before the end of the year. But to me, they are looking at January. They are looking at day one. They are looking at the Royal Rumble, and they are looking at only two people. Cody Rhodes or The Rock for Roman Reigns. And if The Rock can't go, everything is set up for Cody. Can they still change the belt in that time? They could. It damn sure won't be to Drew McIntyre if they weren't pulling the trigger there in front of 62,296 people. They're just, they just weren't, aren't going to do it, <laughs> at least not right now. So Drew's old music with the, the Titan Tron going through his ascension into being the chosen one was on. That popped the crowd. Then his music, current music hit came out to just a monster reaction. Uh, McIntyre hit a spear of his own. Tried to hit a Claymore, but the ref, before the referee counted three, Solo Sokoa made his debut by pulling the ref out of the ring. McIntyre went after Sokoa, then snapped Drew's neck on the ropes. That allowed Roman to hit a spear and get the victory. After the match, Tyson Fury, who actually stopped Austin Theory from cashing his Money in the Bank briefcase by just punching him in the side of the head right before he was about to hand it over to the referee, he then got in the ring, teased some tension with Roman Reigns, shook his hand and walked away, then went over to Drew McIntyre, and they sang American Pie, and then said they were going drinking, and the show went off the air. Interesting way to do it. But Roman Reigns is still your WWE Universal Unified Heavyweight Champion. Be back right after this Wrestling Observer Live. Byline Broadcast Network, Mike Sempervivi here with you. We do this show live every single day, Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern Time to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. I can tell you we're live right now because top of the ninth. Toronto's got one on right now against Baltimore, four to three right now. They're leading bottom of the eighth Yankees over Minnesota, five to two. Brian Alvarez will be back tomorrow, everybody. I promise you he will be. Well, you know, I promise you that right now. Again, let's see how he uh, returns to, to the state of Washington, what state he's actually in over everything that took place. But Raw is tonight. He and Dave Meltzer, for sure, are going to be back for subscribers of WrestlingObserver.com with Wrestling Observer Radio that drops usually about 5.30 in the morning Eastern time. Uh, so that'll be up Tuesday morning. They'll surely be talking about the fact that New Japan is allowing cheering again at Corican Hall. We'll be getting more into that tomorrow for sure, as well as Raw from Kansas City. Tonight, Fightful is reporting that Bobby Lashley is set to defend the United States Championship in a cage match. This is part of an ongoing, and what you've seen on TV with a lot of video features and things like that, Triple H is... Uh, plan to reestablish the United States Championship. Uh, that's one of his goals. He doesn't have to do so much with the Intercontinental Championship, considering that it's being held by Gunther right now, who's the perfect person to hold that belt. The New Day is also apparently scheduled for the show, involved in a program for the World Tag Team titles. And the Usos were not able to travel overseas for Clash at the Castle. So uh, they will be featured as well. Also, rumors about Braun Strowman that we talked about last week. Karrion Cross was in the crowd, got involved in the uh, Drew McIntyre-Roman Reigns match. So I'm sure we're going to get more on that as well. I want to thank producer Jared. I want to thank producer Dom for coming in on this Labor Day Monday. And I thank all of you for joining me. We shall talk to you again after a while. <laughs>